the Omaha supporters of Grassroots Health, I want to welcome you to a very wonderful program today, a vitamin D symposium with three of the best vitamin D speakers that could be assembled. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce Carol Baggerly, an absolutely phenomenal woman, the founder of Grassroots Health, an amazing organization. Carol. I am going to do a presentation for you about breast cancer. How many in here have already had breast cancer? All right. How many of you know somebody who's had breast cancer? Oh, almost everybody. Has anybody ever lived with anybody who has had breast cancer? Come on, Leo, raise your hand. That's my husband. All right. What got me into this to start with was I've had it. And I've had it in more than one way. The treatment for breast cancer, I swear, if anybody ever really did a study on it, might be worse than the disease, all right? We slop it off. I've had a mastectomy, won't tell you aside. I've had radiation until I bled lying on the table. I've had chemo, which has permanently damaged parts of my body. And after that experience, it was like, there's got to be a better way to be kinder and more gentle to this living body that I have, right? I spent a couple of years doing nothing but reading cancer research. Then, almost accidentally, providentially, you might say, I was diagnosed with osteoporosis. Oh my gosh, you must have a vitamin D deficiency. What's that? And then you quickly do some research on vitamin D and cancer, and whoa! That's what I want to talk about. Right now, I want to tell you some things about Nebraska. I'd like for you to have some point of reference here about the statistics. Breast cancer in particular in Nebraska, there are 1,160 cases estimated to happen in 2010. Per NIH, it's $75,000 per case. That's $87 million that's being spent each and every year due to breast cancer in this state. There is at least a 20% potential prevention, and I put up to 75%, and Dr. Cedric Garland, whose name you saw on the first slide, believes it's fully 80% of breast cancer could be prevented if we got our vitamin D levels up to the 50 to 60 nanogram per milliliter range. Let that sink in a minute. Prevented, not early detection. Prevention, doesn't happen. If we only take 20%, that means 232, mostly women, some men do get breast cancer, up to 870, that's the 75% level, wouldn't get it with a cost savings at the only 20% of $17 million a year. Can you and your state use $17 million some other way? Golly gee, I think so. This one is really stunning. The population of Nebraska and many other places around the country is aging, all right? You have 13% of the people over 65 right now. By 2000, oops, I'm sorry, I so missed that. Uh, 10 years from now, you're gonna have 21% over 65, which is an increase of 90 more people with breast cancer and another $7 million down the tubes. That is happening all over the world. The populations are aging. We are going to drown in our health care costs if we don't start preventing disease. This was another paper or another thing done by uh, Ezekiel Emanuel from NIH. The life expectancy has increased since 1960 by almost seven years. The increase from cardiovascular disease changes, almost all hypertension, 4.88 years, the increase from cancer change, that means medication with cancer, is 0.19 years. And that means 10 more weeks of life, of the whole life expectancy. That's all that's changed for those multi-millions of dollars. That's an enormous waste. This is what got my attention. On February the 13th, the day before Valentine's Day in 2007, 
That was the day I came back to the doctor from the doctor with this osteoporosis thing. I keyed into Google. I'm a really great Google person. I keyed in vitamin D and cancer. Now remember, I would had the treatment. I was still gritting my teeth over that. i had been researching it for two years to see what else done. And right there in front of my face when I did vitamin D and cancer, up popped this research study that Dr. Cedric Garland of UCSD, right there in my hometown in California, had just released saying that there was a 50% lower risk of even having breast cancer if you had a serum level of 52 nanograms per milliliter. I sat there looking at my computer terminal, and to this day, you know how you remember those emotional moments of your life? I cried. I couldn't help it. It was like, oh my God, there is a way. There is something that can be done. The tears flowed. I shook. Finally got control of the body, all right? I picked up the phone and I called a friend of mine who works at UCSD and I said, you know this guy? Is he a flake? I mean, you know, is he any good? And she said, Carol, he's probably the world's expert on vitamin D and cancer. And she had just talked with him a couple of weeks ago and she said, he is very discouraged. I said, oh my gosh, how can he be discouraged? And she said, because he feels like nobody's listening. I said, I'm listening. The essence of I'm listening is I have had the privilege, and it is a blessing, it is a privilege. I was retired. I didn't have to have a job. I had a little bit of money. I had time. And I've spent 40 years, 40 years of my life doing sales and marketing in a technical field. It's like, tell me what to do. How do we get there? A few more things on breast cancer. Another study that Dr. Garland put together from data from low at all, getting the serum level up to about 60 nanograms per milliliter is available. It even helps. This was a meta-analysis, which a whole bunch of studies put together. The important thing to note is that the trend line is straight down. It just keeps going down. The data in the studies didn't get beyond the, the 30 nanograms per milliliter, but if you extend it down, it just goes down like the rest. This one was stunning in its own right. This was just last year. This was a study done by Pamela Goodwin out of Mount Sinai in Toronto. And at the very beginning of zero point over here on the left side, there were a group of women who were diagnosed with breast cancer. They all had their vitamin D levels red, and there were some that were greater than 30 nanograms per milliliter. There were some that were less than 20. 12 years later, you take a look at the lines and you see that green line up on the top it says higher vitamin D levels are 50% less likely to spread. Now, let me tell you what it's like being a cancer has been or have had. Have had. I like the have had, not a has been. I'm a long way from being a has been. Have had. One of the biggest things you fear is, oh my God, I'm going to get it. Again. You don't want it again. You've had it. You don't want to do it again. This says it's not necessary. And furthermore, the really exciting thing to me is that it's not too late. Once you've had it, even though you've already had it, please, please, please get your serum level up because you don't want to have it or anything else again. The message that I've got tonight is so simple. I want you to recite it after me. Read it with me. Get your serum level to 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. Got it? All right, one more time. Get your serum level to 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. And specifically for cancer, it affects colon cancer, all other cancers. Calcium intake is important as well. All right? This, I want to show you, you have a picture of this in your charts. This is called a disease incidence prevention chart. And what I want to show you, especially here, is the fact that as you increase your serum level, which is that very top line across the top, which starts at 6 and goes to 60, different diseases are impacted differently. The blue one, which you can't see on the chart, but you can see on your handout, 99% of rickets goes away at 20 nanograms per milliliter. That's what our current public health standards are based on. Look at all the rest of those diseases, please. 
falls, 30. 77% of cancer at only 38 nanograms per milliliter. Dr. Haney, are you going to talk about that a little bit? No? That was a study done right here at Creighton University. Mind-boggling. This one, type 1 diabetes. You can actually prevent it? As a result of all of this grant information, we formed a project which we call D-Action, whose has sole focus is to solve the deficiency epidemic and to create public health policy recommendations so that our governments and our public health officials can actually take action and do something. The project that we are running as a public health project allows people to get tested twice a year, um, get their feedback on it, and contribute to this public health look. We currently have about 8,000 people enrolled from all over the world. We have medical clinics who also help sponsor this in the US, in Canada, in Japan, a new one starting in Amsterdam and one in the UK, for people to take action. As a result of testing within our study confines, when we did our first sample set of people and what are their results as of 309, this was more than a year ago, more than 51 of the people in the US, 51% are deficient. That means below 40. In Japan, I'm going to show you that one. Take a look at that. 99.9% .9 deficient. This is in where the project started in Japan, and it's a group of cosmetic surgery clinics specifically targeted to breast cancer patients, women who are having implants. That's how deficient they are. The green one, guess where that comes from? The study leaders. They knew better. Right? That's how bad it is. This is a picture of some of the data that we're getting from our study. This bold black line across the horizontal line here at 40, that's the 40 nanogram per milliliter range. Down here at the bottom, the intake of vitamin D is zero. Over here, it's 2,000 international units a day, four, six, eight, and 10. So we have people in the study taking those kind of levels. And what we see is, excuse me, I'm gonna back up here. First of all, one of the biggest things to note, please, is the wide dispersion at any level. Like if somebody's taking 2,000 IU a day, which is this line right here, their serum level could be about 20 all the way up to 100. That range is true at each and every level, which is why when you ask me tonight, some of you already did, or when you ask anybody, what dosage should I take? I say, I don't know because I don't know how your body's going to respond. And that's what that says. If you really don't want to test and find out where you are, you say, okay, what can I do with my population? 73% of the population would be above 40. If I took 4,000 international units a day, 83% at 5,000, and we'd get a full 96% of the population above 40 with 6,000 IU a day. And the other key thing to note which you won't see here and you'll see in other presentations, not one of these people developed any signs of toxicity. It is safe. Okay. Our project, I mentioned, is to test your serum level, whether it's through you or anybody else, your doctor. Sponsor our project to the extent that you wish. We would be delighted to have you. And now I would like to close with a very quick presentation by my friend, Dr.